there are many of our people who are thinking more deeply and more broadly, are looking at it as it actually is, and are beginning to see it more in the international context and the relation that it has with the African uh, struggle, the human rights struggle, or the struggle for human rights. And as such, we can then take it into the United Nations. And bring about the freedom of these people by any means necessary. Peace, everyone. This is We Charge Colonialism. We Charge Colonialism, we are an organization of African people, and we are seeking to raise the consciousness of our people that we are being colonized by a global entity known as white supremacy. And because of that, we have to unite as one and fight this thing. Otherwise, we're going to be fighting meaningless squabbles that is not going to get us anywhere separately. Now, one of the ways that this system globally does take us into its trenches is through the domination of our families, African families. If you don't know, obviously, we have communities that are under attack. But the best way to attack the community is to attack the family because families are what makes up the community. You have a bunch of families come together and we call that a community. Because of that, the system makes an intentional effort to do things to really destabilize our families. And it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter if you're inside of the United States. It doesn't matter if you're inside of the African continent. It doesn't matter if you're inside of the Caribbean. It doesn't matter where you are. Our families are under attack. And that is a weakness that the exploiter will use to ensure that we cannot rise up against him. Today I will be going through some excerpts from an article by one of our members, Simba Askofu. And the article really explores how the system of white supremacy has intentionally made an effort to destroy women and children. And because of that, we are inside of a very unstable place. We are inside of a place where we don't know how to fight this thing. And some of us are trying to fight this thing without mending the relationships that have been destroyed among our own people. So some things that uh, Simba points out in the whole article will be in the description as usual. So that you can read in depth because it's a lot of information he put in here. I'm just going to go through some major points. But he points out the foster care system and the foster care system in the United States is something that is to me not as um, recognized to be a white supremacist system. We recognize other systems. We recognize that the prison industrial complex is a white supremacist system. Many of us will recognize that the education system is a white supremacist system. But we fall short of ha having a recognition that the foster care system is also a white supremacist system. The foster so, care system is a colonial machine with 300,000 children in foster care. 70% of inmates across America have been to foster care at some point in their life and will not graduate from high school. 95% will not get a college degree. That's four times, they four, you are four times more likely after going to foster care to be exposed to sexual abuse. Let's admit it, foster care is breeding ground for human trafficking, a pipeline to prison prisoner human trafficking and places like New York, Atlanta, Detroit, Chicago, and Baltimore are notorious for sex trafficking of black women and children. And of course, these are things that we, many of us who have been through the foster care system, if you have been through the foster care system, you may be well aware of. You're exposed to multiple levels of trauma. You're exposed to people who necessarily do not have your best interest in mind, whether it's the caseworkers, whether it's the foster parents who are many times strangers before you come into their home. You're exposed to many people and many of these people could have different reasons for wanting to be involved with you not always the amicable reasons that were told through the media so this is showing you that this is a machine that breeds trauma into the black community as we always say our problems are not individualized they are literally global and so we're going to go right now and talk about the issues that are happening in ghana as far as street children it says according to a new survey in 2001 by the ghana statistical service about 80 percent of children living on the streets in Ghana are between the age of five and 14 years old. Living on the street, these children are forced into prostitution to survive. Their precarious situation makes them particularly vulnerable to exploitation and trafficking. These are children, people five to 14 years old, being put inside of a situation where they're absolutely not being protected by those around them. A 2015 study showed that the prevalence of children who have been sexually abused in Ghana was about 27% for girls and 11% for boys. It's even more shocking to realize that ritual killings of children in practice in, are practiced in Ghana. The reason for the ritual killing often stems from the belief that they are possessed by an evil spirit, which brings bad luck to those around them. Ghana Moving on to the issue of domestic violence of women, it says in 2016, team domestic violence victim support unit of the Ghana police had stated that 27.7% of women had experienced at least one type of domestic violence in the last 12 months 
Um, economic violence being the most common, followed by social violence, psychological violence, physical violence, and sexual violence. Shockingly, several sexual violence is largely considered a private matter, so reports underestimate or estimated underestimated, and the true exact form of domestic violence is unknown. Culture becomes dangerous, destructive, and self-defecating when Black or African women consider this to be a norm to view that someone beating you is acceptable even expect it to keep the woman in line. Most of the surveyed women consider some level of beating is acceptable um, and discipline and every respondent had been struck during the course of their marriage. So these are things that are happening. These are things that are present inside of our global African experience and some reasons why we have to understand that our first priority, priority number one, has to be organizing our families. And if your family is not organized or if others' families is not organized, then that's not going to lead to a very healthy and fluid community. When we're coming together as a community, we're going to come together not as strangers, not as people who don't have anything in common, but we're coming together as brothers and sisters. We're coming together as mothers and fathers. We're coming together, and I'm saying brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, beyond blood. But this is a common experience. But you can't have that type of reverence and respect whenever you don't at first um, have that respect for those who are actually your mothers and your fathers and your brothers and your sisters. So this is an ongoing healing process. This is one that I believe will happen now and also that will happen after we've had a revolution. And it's something for us to always keep in mind that this is a, an area that we have to address if we're always, all, ever going to be a strong African people. So as I said, please read the rest of the article it's a lot of great information. And I ask also that if you are interested in joining WCC, that you hit the join tab on rechargecolonialism.org and submit your application. Someone will get back to you very soon. That's all I have. I will see you all in the next video.